from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org slash wv. West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, working to double the degrees produced annually to meet workforce demands and grow West Virginia's economy. Learn more at wvhepc.edu. The W. Page Pitt School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Marshall University, providing hands-on education in advertising, public relations, and journalism across all media platforms. At the legislature today, senators get into a heated debate over procedures rather than policy on the floor, while delegates hear from nurses about a potential agreement to let them work in multiple states. And we travel to a Clay County farm where a state government program is making a difference for a military family. Those stories and more coming up on the legislature today. Good evening, I'm Ashton Mara. Tensions were high today in the Senate as a motion to move a bill to the chamber's finance committee turned into a debate over the procedures senior senators with years of experience say are being ignored by some members of the majority party. A look now at what happened on the Senate floor today. It started with a simple motion from Democratic Senator Ron Miller as the chamber was taking committee reports. Mr. President, I'd like to move that Senate Bill 219 be referred to the Committee on Finance. Senate Bill 219 creates criminal penalties for involvement in a conspiracy to violate drug laws. It would establish penalties based upon the quantities of illicit drugs that are possessed or delivered. Those penalties range from a 5- to 15-year sentence for a conspiracy involving less than one gram to a 20- to 60-year sentence for more than a kilo or two pounds of a drug. Senator Ryan Weld is the bill's sponsor. This bill, Mr. President, is aimed at the large-scale drug dealers, the top-tier guys, that's who it's aimed at getting, being able to combine that weight to get those big guys. And thankfully, there aren't too many, pe too many of those that operate in our state. A lot of them are across the border and push their substance into the state. So thankfully, we don't have a lot of them. So a lot aren't going to get swept up in this. But Miller says it is possible the new crime with such high penalties could have a significant financial impact on the state. He pointed to data from the West Virginia Division of Corrections. Approximately half of the inmates incarcerated for actual drug offenses are there for offenses involving drugs that are addressed in this bill that we're, we're, we're discussing. If these people had received sentences under, the, uh, under this bill, at the current cost of incarceration, we'd be facing an additional $8.4 million per year for each year of a sentence above the, quarter of the currently imposed sentence. $8.4 million per year. That cost is why Miller says the Chamber's Finance Committee should be able to discuss the potential financial impact. Senate Finance Chair Mike Hall supported the motion even after its lead sponsor, Senator Weld, expressed that he didn't see a need for it to be moved to the committee. We're not going to kill the bill and just the advantage of a second committee that's not on judiciary seeing it in committee means that by the time it gets to the floor, everybody will have seen it. And that, there's no harm in that. The Senate's members are evenly split between the Finance and Judiciary Committees. After a close voice vote, members stood to cast their vote on the motion, and despite the Finance Chair's support, Senate Bill 219 was not sent to his committee. That decision immediately sparked backlash from members of the Democratic Party, including Minority Leader Roman Prezioso, a former Finance Chair himself, who says the committee doesn't change policy to override the decisions of the Judiciary Committee's work. I'm very discouraged by the fact that we've not allowed the process to work. And I hope that this process doesn't continue because we have certainly more financial implications that we've got to look at when you're looking at a state with $500 million in the rear. And if we're going to start this, this pettiness back and forth, 
Mr. S Mr. S President, I I'm, I'm deeply concerned what may happen the rest of this session. Prezioso says when a major committee chair asks to see a bill, they are extended that courtesy. But Judiciary Chair Charles Trump defended the vote. He says his committee did consider the cost to the state, a $26,000 per year per inmate price tag, but that the number of inmates who will be sentenced under this particular bill can't be calculated. Despite the uh, best efforts of anybody to make that prediction, I think it is, at the moment, unascertainable. There's no way to find the answer. As the debate continued, even after the motion had been decided, tensions continued to rise until... The senator from Marion, seek recognition. Mr. President, I move that we stand in recess for 10 minutes. Democrats rushed from the chamber as members of Republican leadership met on the floor. After the recess, Trump moved to reconsider the action. There's a reason I'm on the Judiciary Committee and not on the Finance Committee. And I should not presume ever that just because I can't figure out a way how something could be calculated that no one can. Senators once again voted on the motion to move Senate Bill 219 to the Finance Committee. All those in favor of the gentleman's motion to send Senate Bill 219 to refer it to the Committee on Finance will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. I declare the motion adopted. The bill will return to the Chamber's Finance Committee for further consideration. Members of the House Judiciary Committee are considering a bill that its sponsors hope will curb West Virginia's nursing shortage. Liz McCormick joins us with more. House Bill 2522 would enter West Virginia into an agreement with other states to allow nurses to practice across state lines without having to get multiple licenses. The compact would include both registered nurses, or RNs, and licensed practical nurses, or LPNs, who packed the committee room today as members debated the bill. There are currently 25 states in the nation that are part of a nursing licensure compact, including a number of states bordering West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland, and Kentucky, for instance. The first version of the compact was drafted in the late 1990s, and the first states signed on in 2000. In 2015, the compact was revised, adding requirements for background checks for nurses and creating a commission to oversee the agreements. So far, no states have adopted the new compact model from 2015, and West Virginia is the first to consider it. Supporters of the bill say entering the agreement could help attract nurses to the state who don't want to go through another licensing process. Delegate Amy Summers is a sponsor of the bill. A nurse herself, she says West Virginia has had trouble keeping up with the demand for nurses, but the state has a low cost of living and the pay is good. I have lived in Northern Virginia where the cost of living was more than double what it is in West Virginia. Um, the nurses are making a good wage in our state. There are sign-on bonuses, $10,000 that can attract you in if you want to come to a certain hospital because of the nursing shortage. There are ways to make good money in nursing. Groups representing LPNs disagree with Summers, though. Greg Chiardis is the president of the West Virginia State Board of Examiners for Licensed Practical Nurses. The, the, the bottom line is, is that there's no evidence, at least based upon the surveys from the West Virginia Center for Nursing, that um, joining this compact is going to resolve any nursing shortage in West Virginia. Chiardis says entering the agreement could actually pose a problem for the groups he represents. We are at a saturation point in West Virginia with LPNs. We have 26 schools, we have 8,000 licensed practical nurses in the state, and we don't have uh, really room or jobs available for additional nurses to be coming in from out of state and taking the LPN jobs that we have available that come available each year. Bill supporters also say entering the compact could potentially increase the wages for nurses in West Virginia as the state attempts to compete with other members of the compact to keep them. But Chiardis doesn't think that will be the result. Simple economics would dictate that if you have an oversupply that you would have, you would drive down prices. We would have increased competition which would drive down the, the amount of money that, that these nurses would make. Republican Delegate Jeff Foster questioned Chiardis about the potential loss in wages. Do you have any evidence to bring before us of other states that have adopted this compact if LPN wages did drop? No, sir, I do not. Okay. We just study West Virginia. 
Aside from just the potential impact to wages, some delegates were concerned that entering the compact would also make it easier for nurses to leave West Virginia. Republican delegate Ray Holland also posed a question to Chiardis. You stated that the uh, LPNs may go to some of the other compact states, is that correct, to, to find higher wages? Certainly they could. As, as of right now, we don't have a lot of LPNs that leave our state. They take jobs in our state and they stay in our state. But they have that opportunity with the, if we pass this legislation, is that correct? Sure. Delegates on the House Judiciary Committee adjourned from their morning meeting before voting on the bill. The committee returned to discuss the bill after the House floor session this afternoon. House Bill 2522 was approved on a voice vote and now goes to the full chamber. That same bill was the subject of a public hearing this morning in the House chamber. That's where individuals representing RNs shared their support, while those representing LPNs, just as they had in committee, shared their opposition. Here's a look at what happened in that public hearing today. Becoming a compact state will allow much more flexibility for nurses to practice outside of our state, but more importantly for our border nurses to practice within West Virginia without having to acquire an additional license. Pennsylvania and Ohio are not compact states. So it's uh, a bit disingenuous to, to believe that other states surrounding us are compact states. There has been the, the, the primary concern, obviously, for the LPN board is monitoring the nurses that come into our state. We have a hundred-year-old licensure model that needs to be updated, and this compact offers an innovative approach that is safe and in lockstep with 21st century health care. This legislation would benefit West Virginians in a number of ways, including creating an economical model that allows nurses to practice freely among member states while still allowing states to retain autonomy and authority to en enforce their Nurse Practice Act. Um, my main concern with this bill is the fact of the job market. There is no shortage of LPNs in our area. And as you know, with the loss of the many businesses, there are a lot of people that are looking for different careers, re-entering the workplace, the workforce. Our program caters to these people. So you have people coming into our LPN program who are displaced workers that can come out within 12 months and have a very good job and job security. With this bill, which would allow LPNs just to cross over into the state, they would be taking these very, very uh, needed jobs. That's the big thing with this bill um, that concerns me. We go to Raleigh County now where we meet four more members of the West Virginia Legislature in this edition of Meet Your Lawmakers. Jeff Mullins represents the state's ninth senatorial district from Raleigh County. He's a Republican and was elected in 2014. Senator Mullins serves as the vice chair of the Senate Finance Committee. Rick Moy was elected to the House of Delegates in 2006. A Democrat, he represents the 29th district. Delegate Moy is from Raleigh County and is a school bus operator. Mick Bates represents the state's 30th House of Delegates district. Elected in 2014, he's a Democrat from Raleigh County. Bates is a native of Australia, but a naturalized U.S. citizen. He works as a physical therapist. Lynn Arvon is a Republican from Raleigh County. She represents the state's 31st House of Delegates district. Delegate Arvon was first elected in 2012 and serves as the vice chair of the House Government Organization Committee. In 2014, the West Virginia Legislature created the Veterans and Warriors to Agriculture Progr Program, which helps support veterans who want to learn to farm. Most of those veterans have gotten technical assistance through the help of extension agents and other farmers who've donated their time to teach. 
Now, the Department of Agriculture is exploring the possibility of creating a formalized 12-week agricultural training course to teach veterans how to start their own small farm businesses. State and federal groups met recently to discuss the project. Roxy Todd reports. The meeting was held in Clay County on the farm of Army veteran Eric Grandin. People gathered inside Grandin's new plastic greenhouse, where this year he and his wife plan to grow peppers and other vegetables. They sell their produce at farmers markets and to four local school systems. Representatives from Senator Shelley Moore Capito's office met with Grandin and other veterans, as well as staff with the West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, the Farm Service Agency, and the State Department of Agriculture. Using three freshly painted bee boxes as a podium, Grandin started off the meeting by telling his story about how the Farmers to Agriculture staff and volunteers helped him find purpose by teaching him to farm. In the military, you have a battle buddy who's there to take a bullet for you when there's nobody else. These guys are my battle buddies. They're the ones that have been there for me. Grandin served in the Army for 20 years, and he suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Before he started farming, he says he had given up hope. And we're not just going to lay around and feel sorry for ourselves as West Virginians anymore. We're going to pick ourselves up. He found a mentor in James McCormick, a retired Army veteran himself, who coordinates the state's Veterans to Agriculture program. For Grandin, making that call to James McCormick five years ago changed his life. The thoughts are still there, the memories, but, you know, I've kind of learned to find a new normal in my life. Besides the therapeutic benefits of farming, veterans like Grandin have benefited economically, too. It's made him wonder, how much food could veterans grow for the state of West Virginia? Keith Buchanan of Windlings Food Service in Buchanan says his company is interested in buying local peppers, onions, and potatoes from veterans every week of the year. We're Windlings distributes food to stores and restaurants across the growing. state. Hearing the stories from the veterans is, is, is inspiring. And I think it's a reason why you would want to do it on top of anything else. Buchanan says his customers are asking for more local food, but it's difficult to find farmers who can grow enough produce year-round. He says if veterans could be trained to package large quantities of their vegetables and freeze them, that could extend their growing season. His company is building a new packaging center in Buchanan, where veterans and other farmers would be able to bring their produce to be processed, making it easier to sell to schools, prisons, and senior centers. They buy a lot of the same types of products, and we really think that there's a viable uh, market for things like peppers and onions and things that are main staples on menus. Selling to schools and other wholesale markets, that's something the West Virginia Department of Agriculture would like to teach to more veterans as part of a new 12-week training course. Unlike a conventional classroom, most of the courses would be taught outside on farms, says James McCormick, coordinator for the Veterans to Agriculture program. We think that it's important for us to get these folks on the farm to let them understand, you know, what being a farmer really means. In 12 weeks of working actually in the dirt, you're going to realize whether or not you really want to do this or not. McCormick says the Department of Agriculture is looking at partnering with universities or community colleges for the short-term certificate program. They're working on setting up the training course so veterans could use their education benefits through the federal GI Bill. Well, I think there's sort of a unique model here that nobody's really explored to the level that the Veterans and Warriors to Agriculture program is specifically looking at. That's LG Corder, the director of the Office of Veterans Education and Training at the West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission. He says a program like this could even attract veterans from areas outside of West Virginia. So if there's a gap that they can fill that not only active duty military could access, but then veterans when they're leaving the military could transition into, we might be able to provide some real opportunities for student veterans here in West Virginia. Mary Grandin, whose husband Eric was one of the first veterans to find help through the Veterans to Agriculture program, says she would be thrilled to see an educational program like this become available in West Virginia. To train other veterans like Eric who never knew anything about farming and to see that there could be a program that comes from it to where they could go to school and go train and go learn and then go out and do it and then bring their families on board with it. More than providing veterans with some added income, 
She says farming brings families back together. Abigail, our daughter, thoroughly enjoys being part of the farm. She enjoys the flowers, she enjoys the peppers, and she loves coming to the garden to eat the vegetables when we grow them. So I think other families could enjoy that time together too. The new commissioner of agriculture, Kent Leonhardt, is asking lawmakers to budget $250,000 for the Veterans and Warriors to Agriculture program. That money is going to be used for salaries. It's going to be used for training materials, transportation. We've done pretty well with just volunteers doing a lot of the training and the workshops. But I think it's time that we take it to the next level. And we can be a leader in this nation on how we treat our returning veterans. Regardless of whether they receive that funding, Grandin and the other veterans involved in the program say they're determined to make it work, even if they have to continue to donate their own time, energy, and money to do so. For the legislature today, I'm Roxy Todd in Clay County. There are a great number of people who work behind the scenes at the State House every day to make sure the le legislative process runs smoothly. At least some of those staffers work under legislative manager Aaron Allred, who shows us one of the most important functions under his watch, bill drafting. I'm Aaron Allred. I'm the legislative manager for the West Virginia Legislature. The simplest explanation is I'm over the joint staff. If you work for both the House and the Senate, then you come under my supervision and what we do is all the back office stuff. You know, we print the bills, we draft the bills, we run the computer systems. We draft anywhere from 2,000 to, in rare years, 3,000 bills for introduction. The number of those bills that actually become law every session, discounting the rulemaking bills, is probably somewhere between 200 and in a really heavy session, 400. Now, we only draft bills for members of the legislature, but sometimes a constituent or a lobbyist will convince a member that they should put in a bill, and the member will send them down to see us. So we assign it to a lawyer. A lawyer will make a first draft of the bill, then we'll proof the bill, and we proof for two things. We proof one, just for grammatical errors, but two, the law is pretty big. If you look behind me, you see a bookshelf. Well, it used to be when I kept the code of law in here, a quarter of that bookshelf was the West Virginia code of law. So when you draft, there's oftentimes far more complexity because one section can impact another section of the code. So you've got to be able to proof it also to see if there's any connection between the new bill you're drafting and what the statute presently was. Because my lawyers don't like using the magic word, which in bill drafting is notwithstanding, which means forget everything else in the code. We don't care what else is in the code. This is all that matters. And that's not a good way to draft. You really want to draft by identifying any other code section that affects what you're trying to do and amend that code section if it needs to be amended as well. If it's a very simple bill, say declaring blue and gold the state color. That's not going to take very long. And if I remember correctly, there's actually a statute that says the state colors of West Virginia are blue and gold. But more often than not, the member's coming down with a conceptual idea. They know there's a problem that they want to fix. And it just depends with regards to the complexity of the problem that you're trying to fix as to the complexity of the process of trying to determine what the language is that you put on a sheet of paper that tries to address that problem by instructing an agency or by instructing citizens or corporations how they're supposed to act in order to fix the problem the state's identified. West Virginia legislature. Because why the legislature may be the smallest of the three branches of government. In a lot of ways, it's the most important. It's what sets the law that the executive branch has to follow. It's what sets the law that the citizens and corporations have to follow. It's what sets the law that the judicial system has to interpret. And therefore, there's a real importance to getting that right. And the back office stuff, in a lot of ways, is just as important than what citizens see when they watch your show with regards to floor sessions. Because if that bill's not right, and sometimes they're not, sometimes there's technical errors in them, it can totally destroy what the purpose of that bill is. So you have to get 
the back office stuff correct. The details matter when it comes to legislation. The smallest detail, a comma in the wrong place, could make a difference in how the judicial system interprets a sentence that's in a bill. This has been the Legislature Today. I'm Ashton Mara. We'll see you back here next week. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org slash wv. West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, working to double the degrees produced annually to meet workforce demands and grow West Virginia's economy. Learn more at wvhepc.edu. The W. Page Pitt School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Marshall University, providing hands-on education in advertising, public relations, and journalism across all media platforms. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.